Well, Nature Guide, Angus Kennedy now joins us. Angus, good afternoon to you. John, how are you? Yes, it's good. Good to see the weather warming up a little bit. Um, it's getting a little bit milder, and it's been very, well, it's quite mild, I suppose, uh, but uh, very overcast and, and damp, so uh, great for growth. Great, great for growth, and, and today, uh, I've noticed, Steve, just out the office window here, um, more butterflies starting to fly, uh, oh. which is good, because the temperatures are up, you know. Even though there's no direct sunshine for them, it's, it's quite mild compared to the last few days, so it's, it's nice to see them on the wing. All right, then well, let's talk about uh, one of those butterflies, the uh, orange tip butterfly, and uh, I presume distinctive because it has a, an orange tip. Yeah, the orange tip butterflies are, are, are very distinctive. We have 35 different species of butterfly in Ireland, and um, for identification purposes, luckily, they don't all come out at the same time. There's a few that come out in the spring, and the orange tip is probably the most visible and the most well-known of those. Um, it's the, about the size of a, of a one euro coin or so, um, but I would say most people have probably noticed them at this stage. They start coming out in Donegal around about late April, um, and they really peak in May, and you'll, you'll still see them in June. Um, the males have those bright, bright orange tips, and then the rest of their wings are white. Now, underneath the wing, for both the male and the female, they have a kind of green mottled effect, green and white mottled effect. So they're very well camouflaged. Like so many butterflies, when they close their wings um, and they, they stay still on a, on a branch by a leaf or whatever, um, they pretty much disappear. But then once they fly, suddenly that flash of orange comes out, um, and it's a lovely sight. And that's nature's way of... Um, um, you know, keeping them from predators, is it? Yeah, it helps keep them away from predators and also helps attract a mate. Um, so the orange tips, they want to um, they want to mate with the females who don't have the orange tips. They're white with little black ends to their wings and a little little spot on them, um, or a little black spot on them. But then once they've mated, the females will lay an egg, uh, usually, not always, but usually, on the cuckoo flower, another flower that, uh, or another little species that people probably will have noticed at this time of year. And at the moment, because there's been um, not as much maintaining and neatening up of the, of the roadsides and the verges and that kind of thing going on, uh, a lot of our wildflowers are getting a really good chance. Um, and the cuckoo flower is one of them. Um, it's a uh, very delicate um, pink flower, um, a uh, tall little pink flower goes up to about 30 centimetres or so. Um, and the cuckoo, uh, the orange tip butterfly will lay one egg onto the cuckoo flower. Um, and that one egg then will turn into a caterpillar and will eat up bits of that flower and eventually then um, will survive over winter um, until it comes out and the whole cycle starts again next year. But the point of, of the cuckoo flower and the road verges and things being allowed to grow, if you go and chop down all those flowers now, thinking they're past their best, uh -huh. um, well, then you're destroying that next generation of orange tips um, that have been working so hard to, uh, to pollinate those flowers and to lay their eggs. Uh, we'll get to the hedgerows in just a second, but is it true that uh, orange tip caterpillars are cannibalistic? Yeah, it is, yes. Yeah. So um, what you, when you see the tiny little... If you're looking at, at the cuckoo flowers... Um, just underneath the flower itself, they'll have a few little flowers on these tall, thin green stalks, um, very pink, very lovely things. Um, and they'll grow in fields, they'll grow in ditches, they'll grow in damp places, um, so all over Donegal, really. But have a look at them. Stop and have a little look, look really closely and see if you can find an orange tip egg. It'll be a tiny, tiny little orange spot, um, little orange egg, right underneath the flower head. But there's only ever one, usually only ever one laid per plant because exactly, they would, um, they would eat each other, which uh, mm. is not the plan. <laughs> now, you mentioned there about, you know, uh, preserving these flowers at this time, and uh, uh, someone is, uh, is asking about uh, hedgerows and saying, am I correct in saying that there should be no hedge cutting at this time of the year? It always pains me to see hedges cut at this time, as I feel it's nests and habitats that are being destroyed. It, it, we're not supposed oh, to be absolutely, cutting. Absolutely, yeah. Now, we're not talking... We're not talking the garden, uh, the kind of garden variety, um, but the, the hedges, our roadside hedges, our hedges in the fields, uh, they're protected by the law and they're really important. An awful lot of our nature is, is woodland-based nature, would have originally been woodland nature, um, and has adapted to living in hedges. And then a lot of other species that wouldn't necessarily be um, woodland, but they get their little bit of refuge uh, in the hedge where they mightn't be able to live in the middle of a field and along the hedges where they'll get those wildflowers to eat or where the shrew that is eating up all the beetles and the bugs will be able to scurry along safely. Um, so they're protected. It's protected by the law. You're not allowed to go near the hedges until the 1st of September unless there's a danger to road safety. 
Now, obviously, if there's a danger to road safety, sight lines, hedges need to be trimmed a bit. Um, but you try and do it in consideration for, for nature. But if you see a hedgerow being cut, get in touch with the National Park Service or ring the guards, because it's a crime. Um, and, and it's a, a devastating crime. Sometimes people use quiet times like this to try and, um, and get some sneaky clearance going on because they think there mightn't be as many eyes watching. Um, but it's a, it's a devastating thing to do and it really, uh, uh, but really for the, destroys our habitats. For the most part, those rules are, uh, you know, they're, they're followed and, uh, and people who own land and farmers and that, uh, you know, they observe them and don't do any cutting until September. Yeah, they do. And you see, the hedges have a lot of benefits, not just for um, for nature. They also help with drainage and they also help provide shelter for um, for the animals that are there. But a, a good, healthy hedge on a one acre field, about half of the water that falls in that field will drain through. Whereas if you remove that hedge and replace it with a fence, that goes down to about 2% of the water will drain. So in other words, all that water flows down the field into the next field or into the next farm or into the, uh, the house or whatever it is. So that they help with our flood control as well. From a climate point of view, um, they, they're pulling down carbon dioxide all the time. And the healthier the hedges are, the bigger they're allowed to grow, the more efficient they are with that and the more nature they support. But absolutely, we're very lucky. Our landowners in Donegal are for the, um, the large part very responsible. And you can see that by driving around. There's a lot of, uh, of lovely mature hedges um, that are left alone uh, and are intact. And it's, it's one of the things that gives us such rich biodiversity here, the way that people manage the land, which is great. Speaking of biodiversity, this is actually Biodiversity Week. And there's, well, there's a, a couple of publications that the, the council have brought out. And one in particular is called Gardening for Biodiversity, a very, very simple, very colourful and easy to follow guide for, you know, how you could have increased biodiversity in your own garden. Yeah, it's a lovely guide that is there, and it's free for everybody. Uh, and our own um, heritage officer, our own Donegal heritage officer, Joe Gallagher, has been involved um, with this project. And if you get in touch with Donegal County Council, you can ring them or you can um, email heritage at Donegal coco.ie and they will send you out they'll post you out um, a, a copy of this booklet a 40 page booklet on gardening for wildlife which doesn't mean leaving your garden go mad doesn't mean turn your back and walk away um, but uh, there's a lot of managing you can do while still having very beautiful flowers and very beautiful places very lovely places to sit out in or, or let your children play in um, and this book will help you with that um, there's also online copies of it too um, and they've produced um, a colouring book for children as well um, which is all about nature and, uh, and biodiversity uh, and biodiversity in the garden uh, and it's a lovely thing I know my own children have been enjoying um, using it and you'll find those I've put links to them on my uh, Nature Northwest page in the Rewild Your Child section but you'll find them um, or you'll be able to get the hard copies from Donegal County Council and they're, uh, they're excellent publications and good, great timing for National Biodiversity Week yeah Absolutely. And, you know, we hear a lot about biodiversity and, uh, and, and you know, numerous times you've mentioned as well about, you know, uh, leaving parts of our garden just to, you know, to, to grow wild. But we're not, you know, we're not saying, as you've mentioned there, we're not saying that everybody should let the garden grow wild and then there'll be no places, you know, you wouldn't be cutting grass and there'll be no places to sit out and to have a barbecue or whatever. It's just if everybody had a, maybe a small part of the garden where they, they didn't bother too much with, it would help biodiversity. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you think of where those wildflowers grow. A lot of our, um, a lot of our garden space, a lot of our roadside space, um, is because uh, harks back. The seed bank harks back to um, to much older times, and quite often the seed banks are quite rich. And you can see that this year when things have been allowed to grow, and there's a wonderful variety of flowers of wildflowers coming up. And there's been a lot of comment, a lot of talk, and I think a, people, a lot of people are getting a, a lot of comfort from that, uh, from seeing those. And all that's happened is they've just been left alone. So if you can leave spaces for nature to do its natural thing, um, nature will come back pretty quickly. And then with that will come all of the various different animals um, uh, that are associated with that. And then along will come the birds that will be hunting some of those smaller animals. Um, it's the same kind of thing for making a little pond in your garden. Terribly simple. You don't need a, a big engineering operation. Um, a small little pond couple of sizes um, of a basin and straight away nature will start coming into it and you will start getting various different little bugs and things in there. Um, so biodiversity finds a, way, finds a way, all it needs is a chance for us um, to let it grow and give it a bit of space. Someone asks about moor hens, is it unusual to see them at this time of the year? Um, well, they're secretive little birds, the moor hens anyway, they're always 
hiding and skulking in. Um, uh, you'll often find them in the likes of little canals and ditches and places like that. You'll find them uh, um, in ponds and the water's edges. They have these large, web, well, they're, they're not webbed, they're kind of lobed feet. So if you think of a duck's web feet, they're not like that, um, but they have these big kind of roundy bumps on their feet, which allows them to walk along on all of the reeds, the fallen down reeds and whatnot, that we would just put our foot straight through at the edges of, of streams and rivers. Um, it would be unusual to see them uh, too much because they're very secretive uh, and they nest very low down, so they're always keeping away from predators. However, the males might be kind of stalking around and patrolling their territory a little bit. But if you do see them, they're, they're a wonderful thing to see. Uh, caller agrees with you about the, the cutting of hedges, but asks, what about the spraying of pesticides? All along the road, you can see the burnt results of this, and there's no need for it, in the caller's opinion. And you do see it along the side of the, sides of the road where people have sprayed with, uh, whatever it is. But what's the alternative? People want to keep down weeds, but you know sometimes you see big tracks of grass that have been sprayed, and really there isn't much of a need and you know uh, uh, if you wanted to keep it down i suppose a bit of um mm. a bit of uh, uh just to you know to, to get out the strimmer or something or or uh or the hedge cutter but uh, spraying i mean what's the alternative you want to keep down weeds you know what is the alternative yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, it, hard work is is quite often. Hence, the the reason sprays have done so well is because that they we spray them and we turn our back and we walk away and we think it's gone. We think it's done, um, and the and the weeds start to die. But of course, it's not gone. That spray quite often remains active. It might seep down into our water systems. It might affect the the so soil biota. In other words, the worms and the other things um, that help give us the healthy soil. Um, but I, I've taken uh, great comfort in recent years from seeing there's less and less. And you now notice when an area has been sprayed, if people have been spraying part of the ditch or the, or the hedge or whatever, it tends to stand out more now as that kind of yellow-brown scar. Um, and I think the reason it stands out more is because it's not being done as much. People are becoming more aware of it. Um, and if it's not necessary, if it's not a necessary thing to do, spraying toxins on our land, in our gardens, where our children play, near where we're producing our food, or just where we want to sit down and read our book, um, doesn't make any sense. You wouldn't spray similar kind of toxins in, in all sorts of other environments. Um, so it's something we really should try and keep to a minimum. Um, if you do need to cut the lawn, try just not to cut it as much. Or if you're cutting the verge, try and just give it uh, that little bit longer, as opposed to whacking it with spray. Eventually, some of the more robust grasses and things will bounce back anyway. So you'll still have to deal with it uh, into the future, but you'll just have lost a lot of the diversity. You'll have lost a lot of the, the, the more pretty wildflowers uh, and the associated bugs and animals with them. It's a bit like when you don't get to the, the garden for a while, you don't get to cut the grass for a while and things start to grow up. You just notice more life in the garden. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that people don't cut their lawns, but... You just, you do, you know, biodiversity is a real buzzword at the moment, and this is Biodiversity Week, and I don't want to go, keep going on about it, but uh, I've noticed there's, there's, there's just so much more life with um, uh, butterflies and uh, birds and, uh, you know, small bugs about. Yeah, it's so much more life, and, it, and it's not, um, see, it's quite new, this idea of neatening everything up. Spraying things, of course, is very new, really. It's only in the last few decades. Um, so uh, the seed bank is there. Life will come back quite quickly. Clover, for instance, so the white clover, that is in an awful lot of lawns. And yeah. you can buy clover seed, which is a lovely thing to do to put into your lawn. Um, and if you let the flowers grow um, just for a, a, an extra week or two, instead of cutting every week or every second week, leave it to, to push it out to three or four weeks, the clover and the buttercups will grow. Along then visiting them will be um, some of the butterflies, but the bees, and the bees really need these plants. Um, and then the clover, what it does is it has the ability to be able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the ground. And, of course, we um, uh, spray, we put nitrogen into uh, the ground as a fertiliser, but this is a natural way of doing that. So you're actually improving your lawn by having clover in it. Uh, and, of course, you're helping out the wildflowers in other areas um, by uh, by feeding the bees by doing this too, which doesn't mean you have to leave the whole thing go mad for the summer, but just try and give it that little bit longer. Uh, and you'll be rewarded as well, the, the lovely sound of the buzzing of the bees, and then you'll get the sight of some of the some of the really colourful insects that we have. Uh, a caller had a beautiful and dove. And less work. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, a caller had a beautiful dove who sadly flew into his window and died. Uh, would you know why this might have happened, and is there anything that they could do to make sure it doesn't happen again? 
Yeah, we, uh, and we often hear questions about um, birds hitting windows, and there can be a couple of different reasons. There's the, the breeding birds, and that's a slightly different thing, but the likes of a dove flying into a window, or you'll, you'll often see it with, um, uh, with blackbirds and thrushes, and they can make quite a bang uh, and really, uh, really smash themselves on it. They don't see the glass. Um, there is a huge number of birds um, die every year uh, worldwide because of because of glass. And in fact, uh, some of the skyscrapers in the likes of New York now and whatnot, they are putting in very, very thin black lines. And the black lines are, are less than a centimetre apart. Um, so it sounds like a strange idea to us. But the lines are so thin that you don't really notice them after, after a very short amount of time. But that's enough to tell the birds, uh-oh, there's something there, there's something in the way. Um, and the other thing that can happen if birds are flying at night, they will often see uh, light coming out of these. They will be heading towards that source of light. Um, because you've got to remember, birds, uh, that, that can happen a lot with migrating birds. Migrating birds have been migrating for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, uh, often along similar kind of lines, similar kind of directions. Uh, and and it's only in very recent years that we've thrown up these big buildings um, with see-through panels um, for them, which makes them very tricky. Uh, so unfortunately, that's just what happens. They don't see. But to get over that, if you can um, put, some, uh, put some ribbons, put some um, uh, something, break up that shape of the window, um, put some silhouettes of maybe cut-out birds or something like that, something that pleases you, that you're, you're happy to have and don't have to block off your whole window. Uh, and that way you're alerting the bird and hopefully it'll be able to get out of the way in time. A caller has hedging around her home and was worried that cutting it would be an offence after what you said. And she contacted the council and they told her that it was fine to do it and not illegal. Well, really, I mean, you never said that it was. What you're referring to was uh, uh, hedgerows along, along the road or, or uh, alongside uh, land that uh, joins a road or, the, you know, in, in between fields. Yeah, so, so our big natural hedgerows full of the, the uh, natural native species, um, they are protected and they're protected and, and rightly so. And the, these hedges go back uh, historically, they go back at least 300 years, some of them, um, when, uh, when land was being divided up in that way. And they were used as stock proofing originally, of course. Um, but uh, a garden hedge quite often won't have native species in it, quite often uh, so won't have as much um, uh, biodiversity. And y- you can trim and you can neaten that um, if, you, if you feel the need. I always ask people to try and hold off if they can as well. And if you are trimming it and you, and you do need to neaten it up, just poke your head inside and be conscious of the fact um, that there could well be birds nesting in it. But some non-native species uh, don't really attract birds at all. But too, it's easy uh, as you're going along um, to just poke your head inside and make sure there's no nest there. Um, Or if you look underneath the hedge and you look up towards the sky, you'll quite often see the dark blob that is a hedge. Um, It it makes it easier to, to kind of spot the nests. Okay, let's talk a little about one of your favourite animals. Well, a mammal, as it turns out. And you can do full talks on, on these, and I'm referring to <laughs> bats. <laughs> and they're, they're fascinating little creatures. And unfortunately, they have a bad reputation because people associate them with, uh, you know, sucking blood. And this is a lot of it down to uh, films and TV. And they think that they, they suck blood and they get stuck in your hair. And now they have a ba- an even worse reputation in that they're getting the blame for starting the coronavirus. Yeah, poor old bats are always blamed for something. Um, and you think of Dracula, uh, or you think of, you often associate bats with, with graveyards and scary things. And of course, up until very recently, bats have only been uh, starting to be studied in any kind of comprehensive manner in the last 25 years or so in Ireland. Um, so our knowledge is we're really starting to build it up. Up until recently, there were strange things that only appeared at night um, and went flitting past, didn't seem to make any sound, and nobody quite knew what they were about. Um, the, the, they're incredible species. But they're, they're not rodents, first, by the way, um, so they're quite separate. They're the second biggest uh, mammal group after rodents um, in the world. There's about 1,300 species of bats around the world. We have nine species in Ireland. Now, um, out of those 1,300, there's maybe 600 or so are, are what they call fruit bats. Um, so they grow in hotter parts of the world, and they're very important for pollination. Uh, a well over 90% of, uh, of some rainforests, um, uh, the, the plants, the seeds are spread, or the flowers are pollinated by bats. So they're crucial to rainforests. They're crucial to some of the major ecosystems that we have in the world. Um, but all of the bats in Ireland are insectivorous. In other words, they only eat bugs. They don't come near us. They don't, in fact, they want to stay away from us. Um, they don't get caught in people's hair. Um, they, they're, they're not blind either, by the way. Um, 
and they don't cause us any trouble at all. But what they do do, each bat, every night, will eat over 3,000 bugs, up to 3,500 bugs from around your garden, around your farm, around your community centre or whatever, every single night. So they do, uh, uh, they play an incredibly important service in that way. Okay, so they don't suck blood, but do they cause rabies? Do they carry um, rabies? No, no, uh, there's, no, they don't. There's been no recorded um, cases of any bats in Ireland carrying rabies. Um, so I think last time rabies was recorded in Ireland might have been the 1920s. I'm, I'm not, it's certainly been a long time ago, but not in bats. It's never been recorded in bats. And the thing is that we come into very little contact with them anyway. Um, so we come into very little contact with, with any kind of diseases that might, they might be carrying. Some bats um, do carry rabies in other parts of the world. Uh, that's not something that we should be concerned about. Now, if you find a bat, if you find a bat on the ground, for instance, uh, a little later in the summer, the juvenile bats will start to come out, and quite often they don't find their way back into their home. Um, so the first people might know of having bats in their in their house uh, is when a juvenile bat comes into um, uh, flies in through a window by accident or something like that. Um, and if you do, just wear a pair of gloves or throw a tea towel over it. Um, and try and remove it and leave it outside under some ivy or something like that. So you don't use your, just like a, any wild creature, you don't use your, your bare hands when you're handling them. Um, but there's been no uh, cases of diseases spreading to uh, to humans from bat in Ireland whatsoever, ever recorded. Now, they're, they're mostly nocturnal, and that I presume that is because it's easier to, to hunt for bugs at night. Well, they rely on echolocation, which is an incredible thing. Um, so they shout... And then they're able to picture the echo that comes back from that shout. They're able to picture the scene around them. So when you think of that, it's quite an amazing thing what they do. Now, they shout much, much louder um, than we would be able to tolerate. But thankfully, it's at a frequency that's way beyond our hearing range. Um, but they, they, their shout is about four times the legal limit of nightclubs in Ireland. So you think of if you've ever been to a nightclub or a disco and your ears come out ringing. Uh, imagine four times that loud. That's what's going on above us, around us every night um, during the summer, but it's at a frequency we can't hear. And by that shout, they're able to build up a picture, and that's how they hunt. But really, one of the main reasons they come out at night is because they would be caught um, quickly and easily by the likes of sparrowhawks or maybe even crows and things like that, but certainly by some of the, some of the hunter birds. So they're coming out to just stay away from, um, uh, from other creatures that might predate them. Is it true that they wash behind their ears? Well, there's the long-eared bat is one of our amazing nine species. Uh, and it's, it's very under-recorded because those other bats with their big shouts, you can get machines called bat detectors, which turn that shout into a frequency that we can hear. And then depending on the frequency and the kind of sound, with a little bit of practice, you can start figuring out which species is which. So that's how bat surveys are, are done, um, or, or some of them at least to an extent. Um, whereas the long-eared bats, they whisper more than shout. So you need much fancier technology, much fancier machinery to be able to pick them up with their, their, uh, on sonographs. Um, so they're probably under record, but they will certainly wash behind their ears. Right? They will, like, like so many mammals, they'd be very hygienic creatures, you know. Right. Um, giving birth to just one pup in the year, um, all of the, of the Irish bats do that. Um, so they're not going to take over the place or take over the attic or take over the barn if they are up in there. Uh, and remember that they leave in the autumn time as well because they need to hibernate um, during the winter. And to hibernate, you need somewhere with a stable temperature. Um, and and your, your house or your barn won't provide that for them. And will they, will they have to stock up on, on a lot of insects in order to get through hibernation? Yeah, they do. They they, um, uh, they really build up their fat reserves. And amazingly, I, I think this is quite incredible, they breed in September time. Um, so they breed in September, and then the males and females go off again in their separate ways. Um, but they're able to suspend um, the development of the of the embryo until they come out of hibernation on the other end, um, which is kind of a, wow. a bizarre thing, really. Um, but their heartbeat, which at a resting stage for some of our small bats, now there's three different species of bats called pipistrels. They often have funny kind of names. So the pipistrels, uh, the, the little tiny bat that you'll see fluttering around at the top of the hedge, a lovely thing to do at this time of year uh, is go out in these long, long evenings. Get out there about nine, half past nine, um, and look along those hedgerows we were talking about, and the, the bugs that will be in there will be gobbled up. Um, by the bats, and you'll often see them at this time of year when there's still a bit of light in the sky. They'll be silhouetted, um, and, uh, uh, and it's a fantastic sight, and it's a fantastic thing to do. And they have a, a fairly long lifespan for, for something so small. 
They do, yeah. They're, they're studied for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is the longevity. So normally such small little creatures, um, so that the resting heartbeat is around about 200 beats a minute. When they hibernate, uh, that drops down to about two or three beats a minute, which is just kind of bizarre when you think of it. Um, but uh, they, they're able to live a very long time, whereas most small creatures, if you think of, say, a shrew, which um, isn't much smaller than a bat, really, or you think of, say, our field mice, which would be a little bit bigger than some of our bats, um, their population numbers go up and down really quickly. They can, they can crash really quickly and they can breed really quickly. Um, whereas the bats, they only produce their one pup a year, and they only produce that after a couple of years. For a creature that is so small, and as a heartbeat so fast, that fascinates scientists in particular because they want to think, huh, how can we um, benefit from this? Is there some kind of um, uh, way that we can learn how to uh, prolong our own lives by studying bats? Because they, they move so fast and their heartbeat is so fast, but then they survive for so many years. It sounds like you're really missing your nature walks and uh, your, your nighttime <laughs> bat walks. I am. I would normally have a few bat talks yeah. around the county um, every year, and I am missing them, that's for sure. Um, but those things will, will come back again. Um, but meanwhile, have a look at Bat Conservation Ireland. They have an excellent new, well, newish website. In the last couple of years, they did up their website, and it has a lot of great information on all of our different species of bat. Um, they have uh, a great children's section, which will, will teach you all about um, different bats and colouring things and the rest of it, um, and different ways to kind of see them and what to do if you come across them. Um, now remember they're legally protected but that's, that's important. In Britain it's been worked out bats are worth about £7 billion, uh, pounds, 7 billion uh, British pounds to the British economy. So that hasn't been worked out for here as yet but it'll, it'll be a huge number as well. Biodiversity in general um, has a very important economic role. They say that earthworms are worth about a billion to the Irish economy. The humble little earthworm mm. um, so, and it's a, it's a sad thing in some ways, but it's a, it's a necessary thing to have to start putting economic values on this because, unfortunately, there are some sectors that that's, that's all they will understand. And bats have a huge economic value, and they have a huge kind of pest control value, as well as being amazing. Their skin, their skin will heal ten times faster than our own, so they're being studied for that. Um, they break down lactic acids much faster than uh, Hussein Bolt or, or the, the best athletes or the fittest athletes um, in, in the world can do. So they're studied for that. They've been studied around Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, the, they're fascinating creatures that we're only really starting to get our heads around. So we're learning all the time from them. OK, well, uh, and we've run out of time. Didn't even get to, to talk about to oak trees or birch trees. Maybe we'll squeeze them in next week. And uh, my apologies if I didn't get to your question for Angus. Uh, uh, naturenorthwest.ie is uh, the website. And Angus, we will chat to you next week. That's great. Thanks very much, John. Talk next week.